Welcome back to another episode of Space This Week. Starship testing is at warp 9 once again as SpaceX prepares to launch Booster 10 and Ship 28, but conspiracy theories run amok around the status of SpaceX's Falcon, with an unnaturally quiet week for orbital launches. We also have two very exciting return to flight missions for Rocket Lab and Blue Origin, a bunch of very exciting yet mysterious launches from China, another Soyuz launch, and much, much more. Let's kick off with Starship. It's all systems go down at the launch pad. The next full Starship is there, albeit not stacked yet. Super Heavy Booster 10 and Starship 28. And there's been testing for the ship this week. It was rolled out from the build area and placed on the suborbital test stand early in the week. I do appreciate the way in which SpaceX transported it. I can't imagine any other space company rolling out their multi-million dollar rocket prototype with the transporter draped in Christmas lights, a dancing Santa, Christmas tree and three snowmen. <laughs> After making its very festive rollout, the ship was lifted and placed on the suborbital test stand. But wait, I said the suborbital test stand. I didn't specify if it was A or B, because that's no longer a distinction that needs to be made. Last week, crews began dismantling test stand A, and we saw it come crashing down, marking the end of an era at the gateway to Mars. Anyway, the big event of the week has to be the engine testing of Ship 28. On Saturday, we saw the telltale frosting form on the side of the ship, indicating it was being loaded with cryogenic fuel. Then, a spin prime test. This is basically one step below a static fire. Everything is the same as a static fire test, except at the very end, no ignition happens. Hopefully, everything performed as well as SpaceX hoped, and that a static fire is next on the cards. Over at the orbital launch pad, we saw the reinstallation of the large liquid methane and liquid oxygen flex hoses for the booster quick disconnect system. We also saw work on the ship quick disconnect interface. This has been subjected to quite a lot of repairs after suffering from some damage during the second Starship flight test, but this appears to now be reaching an end. With all this work on the orbital launch mount wrapping up, SpaceX wasted no time in rolling Booster 10 down to the launch pad. This happened earlier today, in fact, so Monday the 18th, and compared to how long things took in the build to Flight 2, SpaceX are really ramping up the pace here. Both ships at the launch site now just one month after the last orbital launch. Now, in last week's episode, I talked about how Ship 26, that weird flapless prototype, had been hooked up to a crane, presumably ahead of scrapping. But since then, some strange developments have occurred. Workers were raised up the side of the ship on a cherry picker, and then they began welding large pieces of steel to the vehicle's fuselage along one of the weld lines. This has never been done on previous, or as far as we know, currently under construction vehicles, so it's really not clear why they're doing this. It could simply be a way to train crews on welding these prototypes, which is what we believe the purpose of finishing Ship 20's heat shield was a few months ago. But alternatively, this could be some kind of Pathfinder modification that we may see on Starship version 2, or, and this is a big or, SpaceX still intend to fly Ship 26, despite there being more complete Starships available now, and they've determined that in order to fly, it needs some additional reinforcements. At the end of the day, Ship 26 has its engines and even has a static fire under its belt, so who knows? What do you think is going on with Ship 26? Let me know your theories down in the comments below. This is definitely one of the most intriguing mysteries happening at Starbase right now. As of right now, it's no longer connected to the crane and is once again standing alongside the other prototypes in the rocket garden. The build site has been swarming with works this week, both as workers continue to complete both mega bays and because the Star Factory is starting to undergo further expansion. We saw the arrival of multiple trucks laden with steel beams, and later on in the week, these started going vertical, beginning the next phase of construction for this building. I wonder if it will, eventually, consume the real estate left behind after the pipe prefabrication building was demolished. Yep, on Wednesday, this structure was ripped down after only being completed four months ago. In order to facilitate the rollout of Ship 28, Ships 29 and 30 were moved out of the high bay last week, giving us a good look at these two beasts, standing looking mostly complete. 
despite being guns ablazing with Starship, unusually we didn't see a single SpaceX Falcon launch last week. Which is kind of crazy, right? Any other space company, this would be totally normal. But most weeks we see two to three Falcon 9 missions, yet we saw nothing for the past week. There's a few reasons why this might be. The main one is that half of Falcon 9's pads on the East Coast are out of use, because pad 39A is currently configured for Falcon Heavy. This was supposed to launch last week, but it's been pushed back to the end of the month. The payload is the very secretive and expensive Boeing X-37 space plane, of which little is known about, but we can assume that anything that might even slightly increase the odds of a launch failure is going to be taken very seriously by SpaceX. They really don't want a launch failure here. <laughs> this setback is therefore doubtlessly going to have a negative impact on Falcon 9 launches, although we are still expecting there to be a Starlink launch tomorrow, Group 6-6. 34, which will launch from the other Cape launch pad, Launch Complex 40. China was a buzz of launch activity last week though. The most interesting launch we saw was on Thursday, which saw the beefy Long March 2 FT launch the Chinese reusable experimental spacecraft, or as I like to call it, the not a Boeing X-37 space plane. Like the Boeing X-37, this is launched like a regular payload on a rocket and then re-enters the Earth's atmosphere after completing its mission and lands on a runway like a space plane. Like the X-37, the general public isn't informed on what exactly this spacecraft is used for. In fact, we can only speculate that the craft even resembles the X-37, as there are no official descriptions or close-up photographs of the vehicle. Very secretive indeed. I think it's a fairly safe assumption that this vehicle plays some sort of role for the Chinese military, but beyond that, who knows? In fact, there's no video of this launch at all that I could find. This is actually the Shenzhou 17 launch from October, which was also a Long March 2F, hence that escape tower in case that caught your eye. The only footage we have of the China reusable experimental spacecraft launching is this amateur footage taken of its first launch in September 2020. There were two other Chinese rocket launches last week. On Tuesday, a Long March 5 carried the Yaogun 41 reconnaissance satellite to geosynchronous orbit. Another beefy rocket launch then. This was the first time that the Long March 5 launched with its new extended payload fairing, so we can assume that the satellite is a big one. Official sources have described the Yaogun 41 as a high orbit optical remote sensing satellite used for land survey, crop yield estimation, environmental management, meteorological warning and forecasting, and comprehensive disaster prevention and reduction. Though in reality, it is quite well documented that the Yaogun satellites are, in fact, largely operated by the Chinese military, and their primary purpose is reconnaissance. The third and final launch from China was another interesting one. This was yesterday, Sunday, and was a Hyperbola 1 rocket launched by private space company iSpace. The payload for this was Deer 1, a prototype recoverable and reusable cargo spacecraft designed to transport optical observations and life science payloads. This sounds a bit like a miniature version of space SpaceX's Cargo Dragon, and will probably be used for experiments that don't need to be supervised by a Taikonaut, which of course China will be able to do themselves aboard their space station. So far it's still in orbit with no word on if it's re-entered yet or not, so we'll have to wait and see for this one. Russia launched their second Arctica M satellite last week on Saturday aboard a Soyuz rocket, which lifted off from Kazakhstan's Baikonur Cosmodrome. The Arctica M satellite group consists of this one and the Arctica M1, which was launched in February 2021. Together, they will monitor the Earth's atmosphere and surface in the Arctic. Roscosmos have stated that the primary functions of the pair will be to monitor cosmic rays and collect information from Arctic facilities and potentially provide assistance in international search and rescue services. We have two return to flight missions to discuss now. The first one to talk about comes from Rocket Lab. Back in September, their Electron rocket suffered a launch failure during the mission We Will Never Desert You. Happily, it seems that the corrective actions taken by Rocket Lab appear to have paid off as this latest launch went off successfully. The Electron blasted off the pad from the Mahia Peninsula, carrying the Suku Yomi 1 satellite, designed for Earth observation, to low Earth orbit successfully. The satellite is operated by Japan's space based company IQPS and is a synthetic aperture radar satellite that can take high resolution images of Earth even if obscured by clouds and adverse weather. This is one satellite that will support the planned 36 satellite constellation, which will be capable of monitoring specific fixed points on Earth, supplying a new image every 10 minutes. Interestingly, this was initially supposed to launch on Virgin Orbit's Launcher 1, but since that rocket and uh, company no longer exist, it was moved to Electron instead. 
Oh, and by the way, although Launcher 1 will never fly again, its launch platform, Cosmic Girl, has been given new life with Strato Launch. Here's a photo they shared of it a few weeks ago. I'm looking forward to seeing what the future has in store for this plane. The other return to flight mission hasn't actually happened yet as of me recording this, but will hopefully take place later today. This is the return to flight of New Shepard, which suffered a launch failure a whopping 15 months ago, resulting in loss of Blue Origin's Booster 3, though the payload was safe thanks to a successful use of the capsule's launch escape system. There was no crew on board, crewed missions are exclusively carried by Booster 4, which is now the only booster Blue Origin have, aside from I guess Booster 2, which was retired in 2016 and is now on display. Blue Origin reportedly conducted a thorough investigation into the mishap and have since made changes to the BE-3's engine's combustion chamber, with all improvements being completed in May this year and the FAA closing its investigation into the mishap in September. Man, I thought they were slow with Starship. <laughs> According to a report from Ars Technica, the original launch date for New Shepard's return to flight was October, but insider sources confirmed that the two-month delay from this was caused by issues with certifying one of the engine's components, presumably one of the new ones? I wonder how different this new BE-3 is compared to the old one. Is it a total rebuild or only a light modification? I also have to wonder which booster will support this mission. Will it be Booster 4? Or will we actually see a brand new New Shepard booster rolled out for this? Either way, it's not a crewed mission. Instead, the rocket will operate essentially like a sounding rocket, carrying 33 science payloads to suborbital space, as well as 38,000 postcards. I really hope this goes well. Blue Origin have been making such promising steps towards actually competing with other space companies this year, with massive expansion of their Cape Canaveral campus, rollout of new Glen flight hardware, and a massive overhaul of upper management. And even though it's only suborbital, crewed space missions that also feature a vertically landing booster are always fun to watch, so I really hope New Shepard's return to flight goes off well. Oh, they scrubbed it. Oh. Well, that's a shame. Uh, yeah, while I was editing this video, uh, Blue Origin tweeted that they're scrubbing NS24 today due to a ground system issue that the team is troubleshooting. Hopefully, uh, the new date is soon. A bit embarrassing now that I've just edited this whole bit of the video so far. Um... Yeah. Well, anyway, yesterday actually marked a really cool anniversary. Exactly 120 years and one day ago, Orville and Wilbur Wright made history, conducting the world's first ever sustained controlled flight of a heavier than air machine, or I guess aeroplane as we would now say. This was one of the defining moments of not just the 20th century, but for humanity as a whole. And it's crazy to think of all the things we've accomplished since then, landing a man on the moon less than half a century later wild stuff. Tomorrow is a big day because it's the launch of KSP2's first ever roadmap update, For Science, which adds thermals, science, tech tree, missions, a fix for wobbliness, and more quality of life improvements than you can shake a landing leg at. And you can bet that I'll have a video out tomorrow to cover this. It's going to be released at 10am Eastern Time or 6pm Universal Standard Time tomorrow, so keep an eye out. Everything on screen is not from this video though. The super special content in that is still under embargo, so this is some preview footage I have from October. But let's just say that my video will be a big dive into For Science, so get hyped for that. Also, massive thank you to the heroes who make all of this possible. My Patreon supporters and YouTube channel members, their names are on the left there. I couldn't do any of this without your support and I really appreciate everything. But that's the end of the video. I really hope you enjoyed it. And hey, if you did enjoy it, then make sure you leave a like as well. And that's it. I'll see you tomorrow to play KSP2 for science.